Welcome. Um, we are talking about preparing for the 2025 enrollment cliff and other higher ed challenges. Fun I, topic. I always ask Mike Kaczynski why we're doing today's episode. Mike, why are we doing this? Yes. Episode? So we anticipate that there will be a potential 10 to 15% drop in traditional incoming college students starting in 2025. Um, we'll probably see another cliff in approximately 2037. May have heard of this pandemic that uh, this is happening. Um, that's not the only challenge though in higher education. So we'll discuss some of those lesser publicized challenges and moreover talk about tactics for uh, institutions to help you all uh, survive and thrive in, in this chaotic environment. You can't pound the table because it shakes. That's right true, now. sorry, That's and okay. lighting. Uh, Jeff Meese and Kelly Eiler are joining us today. They, they are, are guests and we're so happy to have um, them both on um, today's discussion. Let's introduce our guests. I'll start with Kelly. Um, Kelly Eiler, say hi to uh, the folks in the FYI audience and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, hello everybody. So excited to be here with you all. I love digging through the chat and seeing how many universities are represented here today. So glad to have you all here. Mm -hmm. um, I am actually working with Mongoose right now, but about six months ago, I was working in higher education. So I do have experience as an assistant director of admission in higher education. So I'm excited to dig into this a little more today. Very good. And Dr. Jeff Meese, why don't you uh, tell us all about you? Absolutely. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, looking forward to this. Why? When we talk about the fact this topic and being able to have this kind of conversation, I was I felt lucky a to be able to work with uh, all three of my colleagues on this, four including Lexi, because um, this is so huge. And of course, I'm I'm sure the reason everybody's jumping on board is because this is this can go a lot of different directions. So I'm hoping it does. Uh, anyways, um, as as Mike said, Jeff Meese, um, I've been with Mongoose now for about five years, coming up on my fifth year anniversary. Um, but prior to that, I spent 25 years in the enrollment management uh, space, overseeing enrollment management at a handful of institutions. So uh, liking to keep my hands into it with the research, stayed in touch with my colleagues, that type of information. Um, actually, also been fortunate to work with uh, Ruffalo No Lovitz and be able to do some consulting on that end. So that keeps me, keeps me in the game as well. So looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, we're happy to have you. Um, Mike, um, we are going to get right into questions because we don't bury the lead. We do not. We do have visuals, which we do not often have oh. for today's episode. Yes. So as we get into, um, uh, our guest just told you why they're going to be great answering the questions. As we get into the questions, we want to provide some visuals for our conversation. Yes. So if we start off with the first question being <laughs> obvious, what is the demographic cliff? Yeah. And uh, I guess, Kelly, if you could answer that for us. And Lexi, do you mind sharing the, the charts? Okay. Um, for us as well. So we're going to talk up, Kelly's going to talk about what the demographic cliff is as we'll uh, Lexi provides sure. visual representation. Yeah. So in a, in a brief way, the demographic cliff is really referring to the idea that once we hit about 2025, there are just going to be fewer 18 year olds to go around. Right. And this really starts back from the 2007 recession that happened. Um, during that time, families just responded by not having children. So 18 years later, we're seeing from that birth dearth that there are going to be fewer 18 year olds in 2025, 2026. And it's really going to impact us over the next decade as well. So you can see here that different subgroups groups actually respond differently over time. So if we look at Hispanic students or Asian American or Pacific Islander students as well, you'll actually see a little bit of an increase, while other subgroups you will see that steep decrease. So it does change and vary depending on location, depending on different subgroups, but that's kind of the gist of what it is. Yep. And you'll notice too, as we alluded um, from our pandemic, that drop off um, and yes, those peaks and valleys in between, as uh, Kelly said. Yeah. yeah, and I, th I think one of the things that I find so interesting in this, and again, this this whole idea of this cliff coming um, has been around for a bit. And I think the other thing that's interesting for those on the call or on the webinar who've been in the business for a while, you've seen these things before, right? These are not these are not new things. They look a little different. You put a different year in front of them, those types of things. But we've always struggled and and been challenged with identifying um, who to serve, how to serve them, but also like really knowing, knowing like what kind of numbers are going to be available. And, and you all know from within the last few months uh, across camp, your campuses, but specifically if you're in enrollment management, you know what you've been dealing with, with those kinds of numbers and, and how that's going to be working with your 18 year old. So that's a great, that's a great segue, Jeff. Kelly, let's talk about the impact. Like we talked about what the cliff is, what impact does it have on our audience today? 
Yeah, so obviously, um, primarily students, we're looking for the traditional age students in higher education, right? Many people are focused on that incoming freshman. So seeing that decline in 18 year olds will definitely impact enrollment, which means that we need to start strategizing now for how to make up that net revenue in different ways, correct? Um, so if you look nationally, it does vary depend on depending on area. So the Midwest and the New England territory in particular, you will actually see a steeper decline, up to 15% decline in the number of high school graduates um, around 2025, 2026, and so forth. Whereas some areas in the West will actually experience potentially an incline up to 7%, right? Um, so it will vary depending on location, as well as the type of institution that you're at, right? So some of the more elite institutions, Ivy Leagues, public institutions, they will have different experiences than some of the four-year private schools may have. So it will definitely be a different experience across the board, depending on where you're located, the type of school and the students that you serve. Yeah, you and want to I'm, think about, you, you also want to think about too in, in all of this, that as an as your institutions look for your planning, uh, from your planning perspective, um, if you are a regional based uh, or more locally based recruitment environment where you're getting all your, getting your students from, that's one aspect of it. So if your numbers are going to be looking to be dropping with these 18 year olds, uh, specifically to your area, that's one thing. But if you're doing this at a national level, and if you're an institution that's out there really, really hitting at a national and international level, then it, it may be one of those things where you're just looking to shift where you're bringing uh, in the majority of your out-of-staters. Um, and what that might look like. So again, the solution to some of this or, or um, ways to address it um, are gonna differentiate, as Kelly said, based on, on where you're from and who you're recruiting. Yes, and actually on that note too, keep in mind that some states, even before we factor in these population shifts may be um, net importers or exporters of students, right? So New Jersey is already net exporting students out of their state, and they're going to see a drop in the number of available students in their state. So it's going to double hit some institutions because of um, that phenomenon as well. I'm looking to see if we have New Jersey colleges that have shouted out in the chat. Not yet. I don't. Not yet. That doesn't mean they're no not garden states. Well. That's right. So. Yeah. Yes. Well, good. Well, we don't like to just doom and gloom people. So um, I guess solutions. Yeah, we're we we are like uh, John Taffer. You know, we we embrace solutions, not problems. Oh, right? higher ed rescue. That's right. See, that higher domain, ed rescue. see if that domain's available. We work on it. So I guess starting with Kelly, what would you do to address this? Yeah, so Jeff and I were actually talking a little bit about this last week, um, the idea that I feel like a lot of institutions have a tendency to focus on recruitment and focus on recruitment of those incoming freshmen, right? We have a tendency to say, that's our main revenue source, let's give attention, how do we recruit more and enroll more students? However, there are more ways to get to the point that we're trying to get to. So institutions aren't always just looking for more students necessarily, some maybe, of course, but the real big goal is getting more revenue. Right. So the idea is trying to explore ways to get more revenue in other ways outside of just focusing on recruitment. And one of those ways is definitely retention and giving a little more attention to that as well. So, Jeff, I'm actually going to let you hop in here because I know you have a lot of thoughts on that. I do, but that's usually dangerous when I have these. <laughs> um, so, again, and, and as Kelly talked about, we, we kind of we really went in depth as we were preparing for this conversation today, the, this whole idea that. I know many college campuses and many folks that are on the call today or, or on the webinar today um, hear it on a regular basis if you're in admissions that, okay, we just have to bring in more students. We just have to bring in more students, go in and get more. I think what we're starting to see, and this is not something new, this has been happening for you know 10 plus years, is really when an institution starts to evaluate what they're doing for retention and how they're keeping their students on board. And, and that's a big topic, it's a big challenge. There's, there's tons of work that needs to be done when you talk about really having to improve that retention. Um, but, but one of the core things I believe that you need to look at is really service to students. And what does that look like? And I know some of the folks on the call are gonna be very you know, taken back when I use the term, but the idea of customer service really does come to, for, to, to the forefront here because if you're not only going to be looking at, at how to how to effectively make uh, make some changes, but when you look at the students you've already got, they already are connected to your institution in many many ways. 
Um, so thinking about it from the standpoint of how do we best keep them, right? We also know for those that have been in the recruitment game for a while, the, the reality is it costs less to retain students than it does to, to get brand new ones. And so the great reality when you talk about net, rea net, net revenue impacts, to focus your time and energy on retention and service to your students and, and to their influencers. Because again, let's also remember, um, I'm from, I, I use the terminology when I was on campus all the time with when we talk about retention, we're talking about re-recruitment, right? You're always having to resell your institution in some way, shape or form to the uh, population you already have, but it's a lot easier because they're already bought in in many, many ways. So um, this focus on retention, um, and it's not that we're saying to pull it completely away from recruitment. The reality is, is that you just need to spend more time on it potentially. Um, and, and, and maybe your institution is, maybe your institution spending, spending the kind of time and energy and you're seeing the retention numbers that you'd like to see. But the great reality is I think the majority of folks on the, on the webinar today probably could use that opportunity to, to really rethink the way that retention looks on campus. So Jeff, I would actually like to dig into that in a little more, just because I've had enough conversations just from my own experience, from colleagues from other institutions and whatnot, where they do focus on retention and they gather all the data that they can and they make changes in the best way that they know how to, but still see little movement of the needle, nothing that has any huge impact necessarily. So when you're thinking about things that can help make a bigger impact, I guess, what are some of the places to start that you think of? Yeah, well, I think, and this is a great question, Kelly, right? Because um, I think most cases, when we think about how we can improve retention, we think about things like services like um, academic advising. We think about things like housing. We think about things like maybe student activities in that process. I challenge folks to take a look at it another, at even another level, which is what about the regular service that's being provided on campuses for folks that, that you don't even deal with on a regular basis, maybe as an enrollment manager? Um, so how, uh, how is the um, support staff engaging with folks? So if you've got people, not only um, let's, let's say janitorial staff, any folks like that that have a day-to-day -day engagement with students and with their families, those are the, that's the level that we're talking about getting to when we look at customer service or service to those students that are in there. Because every little bit of their, of their um, engagements, those are gonna be the things that help them decide whether they're staying on or whether they're not whether they're gonna pay that tuition or whether they're not going to pay that tuition. Now, the other great reality with all of this and everybody knows is that with college costs continuing to stay, either in some cases stay steady or increase in many cases, um, being able to afford it on a regular basis. How can we continue to afford um, the particular um, tuition cost or the overall cost. That's another variable when you think about the institution as a whole. It's not a financial aid issue. That's an institution as a whole issue because how can then we support those students through, um, again, scholarship, uh, other kind of aid that, that might be out there also. Yeah, and if I may add to that too as well, your students, when you look at the, the, the demographic cliff or demographic shift, enrollment cliff, whichever terminology you prefer, and you look at those students, you look at their families, to me, I think language services are going to be important, right? So, you know, not just hiring admissions counselors or admissions advisors who can be bilingual or multilingual, but thinking about that throughout your staff, because while they might be communicating with these students primarily in English, and we might want to encourage that fluency, um, we might not have those same standards for parents when they have questions, right? So being able to articulate very advanced, difficult financial aid concepts to someone who's not a native English speaker, it gets significantly easier when you speak that native uh, language natively. Um, for Jeff first, and then for Kelly, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this. I get the sense that institutions are going to move away from test optional, and we're going to see more test blind um, admissions. So uh, we help students move through the funnel faster. Do you think that's going to happen? Um, I think it depends on the institution, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to continue to see, um, again, regular tests. I mean, we see test optional, especially with the pandemic right? Um, and how so many institutions went to that. We're already starting to see institutions slide back into or go back into testing as part of the process. Um, and again, just off the top of your head, you're looking at things like the IVs are doing that. Some of the more selective institutions are going to be doing that process. Uh, to your point, Mike, I think that um, we're going to have an opportunity in this country to be able to really reevaluate the whole process. 
And so when I say that, what I'm looking at is that I think there's going to be enough institutions across the country that are going to look for different ways to evaluate students' um, likeliness or readiness to an, in, come into an institution. And I think there might even be options that we haven't even seen yet um, that, that, that might come up on the table in the next two to five years um, on how that process looks. But again, I think it's going to be based on the kind of institution, the selectivity of the, of the institution that are gonna really be the kicker when it comes to the testing. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would actually agree with a lot of what you're saying. The only other piece that I think of is trying to get buy-in from an entire institution, because I know there's definitely some faculty, some departments, some areas do appreciate having some testing available. And even though there's data to support the test optional is a great direction to go, um, it might scare people to go fully test blind and to get buy-in across campus for everybody within those purposes. So I do think it could take a little time to get all the way in that direction, but I do agree that there is a potential that it we as an entire higher education society could be moving in that direction long -term. and and there's got to be something to replace it right i mean there's got to be something that that is going to be created and i know the the higher education as an entity has been dealing with this for years right before even any of the pandemic came in there is like if you pull testing out what would you fill in in order to be able to really get a good assessment of how prepared a student is, no matter where they came from, in order to, to, to be successful at your institution. Um, and it's things like reading essays and how to go about reading essays properly, um, because the traditional way that most institutions will read an essay is, is uh, what's the grammar look like, you know, what's the spelling, all those other aspects versus what is the student really trying to get to in this conversation? How can they articulate themselves effectively um, and you, and what I mean by the institution has to be ready for that, you have to train your staff, your faculty to do that kind of reading because it's mm -hmm. not their norm that they would do. So, um, so thinking about what your other options might be when it comes to um, other ways to assess uh, students' likelihood to be successful at your institution. I'm going to have Lexi read a, a question that just came in that's kind of important for this topic to make sure everyone's on the same page. But um, yeah. if we're talking about thinking about things through a student's perspective, I would tell you that, uh, like, if I'm a student and I'm listening to this discussion and Jeff asked the questions, well, schools are going to have to think of a different way if we don't use tests to determine whether or not a, a student is eligible for the institution. I would say grades. <laughs> like, you know, like that's what a student would think, because I just spent four years busting my butt in high school. Yeah. Why is that not good enough? So just something to think about, always be thinking about the student's perspectives, because if they're frustrated, you know, with your institution or just higher ed in general, like what can you do to help that out? Um, Lexi uh, Croisdale is going to just ask the question that just came up because I think it should be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. While we're talking about it, Sarah asks, can you explain test blind versus test optional? Yeah. I, if you don't mind me taking it, I was going to, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> go ahead. So test optional means that, and by the way, Sarah, go uh, brown shows. So um, test optional means that an institution can consider um, ACT or SAT results if submitted. Test blind means they don't even look at it. It doesn't exist. It's not on the student's file in any way. Is there test mandatory? Like, is that still yes. a thing? Okay. There are yeah. still institutions that yep. still require tests. Is that like and, the and I'm majority? Generalizing right no. Not and definitely and Greg, not. I'm generalizing right now, but but mostly the highly selective institutions, they're going to be the ones that'll that'll tap into it. But my and, and let me go back to Greg's point a minute ago, right? The, the confusion, even when a student reads that test optional versus test blind and all that other stuff. I'm just from personal experience with friends who have kids going up through this over the last two years. It's been amazing just to get their feedback. Again, having no tie to higher education at all and asking questions and the parents asking questions to say, oh, well, am I hurting my kid's chance right. if I put the test in or if I don't? And if I don't do it at all, then what's that going to what's going to happen there? There, there's so much apprehension and, and confusion still with that, um, that, that I think it's an opportunity also for institutions to, we talk about ways to address and, and become very customer service, customer friendly in this. That might be one way to help students through this is really sit down during your fall preview days, during different kinds of events that you might have to really go through what that looks like and what that means. And I'm sure some institutions are already doing that, but kind of across the board. 
Yeah, I just want to kind of add to that. Like every institution does it differently too. Test optional can still look a little different from one institution to the next as far as how it will impact your admission process, right? Um, so it's one of those things that I think universities absolutely need to lean into communicating that to prospective students, particularly to be clear on how to be to set yourself up for success for admission, essentially. Mm -hmm. And if I may throw it out there uh, for individuals who are not already in the Facebook group, um, College Admissions Experts um, is phenomenal, not because the advice, the advice is usually very bad, but getting the uh, perspectives of, of parents and students and what terrifies them um, and why is super uh, interesting. And I think very, very helpful for institutions to see those kinds of questions. I was I was suspended from Facebook, so I can't. Oh, Mom kept reporting. My, this might be a good plug too. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't go down this rabbit hole. It'd be very easy to. Um, but um, hopefully the folks on the on the webinar um, are paying attention to stu to parents and mm -hmm. are paying attention to influencers because that's going to be another big piece to this, especially as we see the cliff coming. Um, if there's fewer 18 year olds to come after, you better find better ways to get to them. And one of the ways to do that is in, is to connect with their influencers and and the people that <laughs> sometimes are paying the bill. You know, right. some things we've already talked about. Um, more questions coming in, and I just want to take this time to, uh, and this opportunity to um, encourage you, um, as uh, you have our two experts on, you have our panel here. Um, make this about you, audience. Uh, if you have a question that's uh, centralized or personalized to your institution, um, please ask. Also, like things like test optional, blind test, if you have comments on that, you don't even have to ask your question. Just use that chat. Let's get it populated with some um, thoughts. Whoa, some are just popping up as I'm talking right now. Like, let's get some commentary going in the comments and have some fun here. And also, um, if you have a question, um, we'll make sure that we address it. We're going to continue to do that right mm -hmm. now as more of them are coming in. So, Lexi, get ready but this is your uh, for your institution not for our institution so That's make right. sure that you're asking questions of kelly and jeff and we'll make sure we get them answered lexi has been properly prompt lexi what's our next question <laughs> yeah so corey had asked what the name of the facebook group was called again and that's college admissions experts i actually just dropped a link for it in the chat as well if you're interested um we also had a question from carrie they want to know, are high school students more likely to apply to schools that are test blind instead of test optional schools? Is it a good recruitment tactic? Well, I'll answer the second part first. It is a good recruitment tactic. Um, whether or not the students are going to apply more to a test blind or test optional is probably debatable. Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, so this is really interesting, right? I think it all has to do with the student's academic background. Right. This is what this is why I'm going to th I'll throw it out this way. I believe and I've heard um, anecdotally from from different students that the more um, it, when you're looking at institutions, let's say Ivy League schools, that type of thing, there is a concern that students and the parents have about the quality or is other issues there when it comes to, oh, if you're test blind versus test optional. Um, and so I really do think it has to do with the students' um, um, academic prowess in many ways, their prep, whatever it would be, and the type of institution they're going to apply to. Um, so so that, that'll be one factor. Yeah, I think it's interesting because anecdotally, I've heard a few different things. Um, I've kind of heard both sides of things where some students prefer schools that are at least test optional. I don't know if there's a preference between test blind and test optional necessarily, but that don't necessarily want to take the test. They may recognize that they're not great at tests or may not just want to put the time into it and are curious to explore those options. I've also heard the other side where students score tremendously and want it to be taken into account because of that, right? Um, so I think it really depends on the student that you're talking to on what their particular preference is and what they're looking for from their college experience. And it can be as simple as um, if you have a lower income audience that you're looking to recruit, test costs money. And that's, um, like that, that's a big mm -hmm. thing too. So it is, you're right, Kelly, it's, it's about audience as well. Again, I think this whole testing scenario has to do with the fact that it still feels like from the outside, and I say this from a, have, having been an insider on this, um, it still feels like there's something hidden that they don't understand and they don't know, right? So what are you gonna use to evaluate my application? And I think the more clear that institutions can be about the evaluation process, that will be another big benefit 
to the connection with students and to their families. The, the, the least amount of ambiguity that you can have in your process, the better. And that may, that may put some folks on this call off, that may put some other folks off. It's like, no, 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 this is our process. It's worked for years, this is how we're gonna do it. That's great. It doesn't mean that your, your students and their families understand it. And, and that could be an issue. Yeah, um, while we're talking about what works for some, Carla shared from Florida Southern College. Um, speaking from the perspective at Florida Southern College, we're test optional. It's tough for students to decide which one is best for them. I work with internationals and it's a whole other layer for them. A student who is not looking to test will likely prefer test blind. My test optional students sometimes get concerned when it comes to competing for a scholarship opportunity with someone who is submitting test scores and has a similar GPA to them. Yeah, Carla, that's a great point. I'm glad you pulled that out because the other variable to this is testing that ties into scholarship options because there's so there are so many institutions that, that tie their scholarships to the test, which again, may be something in the future that you have to look at a little differently from a scholarship standpoint. Um, but as it, as it sits more recently, yeah, that is definitely a variable to, to, to play into the process. Yeah, I always say be as clear as possible with what your school does, right? If you have specific scholarship brackets that you have, if they're shareable, share them so people can kind of evaluate that. Um, I remember having conversations with my students about these kinds of things, and they would say, should I submit the test score or not? And we just have blunt conversations around that, right? So I think the more information you can share about how those things are determined on the back end, the easier it is for students to make those decisions as well. Awesome. Um, keep the questions coming. Uh, I love it. Uh, moccasins. What, what was the? Yes. I, is that it? Okay. Yeah, mox. Awesome. Thank yes. you for the uh, the question. Um, so the challenges and the the discussion so far has really centered around um, enrollment retention, enrollment management, student success. Um, but we like to represent our audience, and I know we have some advancement folks in there. But also, like Jeff said very smartly in the beginning, it's everyone's job to make sure that the clock keeps turning, so to speak. So, what can institutions do um, from an advancement um, perspective in order to um, help prepare for the uh, the twenty twenty five clip, as we're calling it? Yeah, I think this is something really great to focus on just because it's about the entire student journey from beginning to end, and that includes alumni as well, right? And making sure you're able to build those connections with your alumni in meaningful ways as well so that they feel that connection with your institution. They will also be your biggest promoters if you have that connection and continue to, to bring that about, um, but they will also be the ones to participate in your giving days as well. So starting with building and keeping those connections is definitely an important place to start. I love the institutions that literally have a celebration with alumni the moment graduation happens, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, that's that it's that transition from a student that's graduated moving into that next phase of the journey, which is now you're an alumnus uh, and a potential donor and a potential influencer, all those things that play out. Uh, but if anybody does not think that your alumni are an absolute critical phase to your enrollment management plan, you are mistaken. Uh, because the reality of all of this ends up being, and again, I think a lot of people will think about, I know coll former colleagues of mine, and still colleagues of mine in the advancement space, would tell you, well, it's like uh, those recent alumni, you know, they're looking for jobs. They don't necessarily have money they can donate, that type of stuff. All correct. The challenge ends up being you still need to stay connected to them and you need to build that relationship with them because even though they may not have those big funds and, uh, and monies to be able to donate to you immediately, that is something you're building over a period of time. And the folks that have been in the advancement, and I know FYI was connected with the advancement mm -hmm. discussion uh, during the last episode, um, but the reality of this ends up being there are many other things that you can provide and that your recent alums can provide back to the institution. For example, in the recruitment area, having alumni tie back and volunteer time to the institution by actually going in and, and having conversations with prospective students, right? Here's my experience. I recently did this. I just graduated. And, and this is why I think you should look at such and such institution. That's a huge thing. Doesn't cost a cent for them. They're not having to donate other than their, in the, than their time, 
right? You can also have them join you for college fairs. You can also have them join you for different kinds of events, those types of things. So there are lots of ways that you can really connect with your alumni. Um, and I think it's just a matter of being creative about how you might want to do that. And part of that also goes making sure you stay up to date on their information. They're probably moving a lot. They're probably, you know, uh, different addresses, different types of things like that. So staying in contact and having a good solid database in order to stay connected with them all the way through that process. Yeah, I think this ties into a conversation we were also having around communicating outcomes, right? That's something that prospective students particularly appreciate hearing. So having those connections with your alumni to be able to know what they are doing, the successes that they're having, where they are working, and how they're using the degree that they got from your institution and being able to bring that back to your prospective students will be impactful for them as well. The Not to mention I, the next cliff coming up um, that we just discussed, alumni have kids mm -hmm. and there's no better, um, you know, um, person to talk about your institution than the parents of the kids that are coming up down the, um, the, the, the pipeline, so to speak, it's a terrible word to phrase it, but like that, you know, we're talking about the long-term game here. So like right. that matters too. Well, That's a lot good. of times too, your incoming students might not be at a point where they can truly appreciate outcomes and, and data, but parents can, right? So sending alumni um, to, to answer questions via text or uh, to have them, you know, sign little um, thank you notes or congratulations notes um, are all really clever ways I've seen institutions uh, gauge alumni. In fact, I would argue that the 24 year old alumnus alumna who can't give uh, a lot of money, the value of them bringing in a student at, you know, let's say $15,000 a year is significantly more valuable than the, you know, 1500 or maybe $150 they might donate, um, you know, annually. Mm -hmm. That's now, true. There's there's one other point if I could throw out because again we don't we don't always give our community college friends a lot of love and I want to I want to reach out and 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 just throw a piece out here I know a lot of them are doing some some of this very very well but the other question I always ask is is from the community colleges that are out there are you staying connected with those students that have transferred have they they've gone on to a four year institution right are you still in contact with them if they graduated from your institution had a great experience that is a valuable, valuable alumnus that even though they're an alumni at another institution, they're still your alumnus. And how are you staying connected with them and, and still engaging them uh, potentially locally? Because if they're still living local, in many cases, they've attended your institution because it was a local option for them. So if they're still there, using them for different events, using them for different opportunities. So uh, don't, don't forget, even though they've transferred, they're still an alumnus. Mm -hmm. This pocket's been interesting when talking about advancement, so I want uh, Lexi to get to a couple of comments that just came up. Um, so much to cover here. There's still lots of time, though, to get your questions in, and Lexi has a couple that just came up. Yeah, so Carrie commented first, um, engaged and connected alumni goes back to the customer service statement we were talking about before. Students who are engaged and feel valued or more likely to be engaged alumni. Um, Sharon also shares that we brought up a good point on community colleges. And then we, our question comes from Nicole specifically. She loves the idea of alumni sending texts and wants to know how we're managing that or some ideas we have around that. So who wants to, well, I'll talk about texting. So they were waiting for you to jump. <laughs> yeah, I was like, usually I'm the you jumper. You see how we so all kind of just stopped? We were just kind of like, like, yeah, yeah, what? Exactly. You know, yeah. yeah. I'm like Alan Iverson over here, ISO. So um, long story short, what I would consider doing, Nicole, is creating uh, some type of texting takeover. Um, night where your alumni could be in a, oh, let's say shared inbox to use some mongoose cadence uh, terminology and uh, parents can text in and ask questions. And, uh, you know, these are alumni. So you give them, um, you know, probably give them some talking points and some themes that you want to keep them on. But, uh, you know, you encourage them to be fairly candid as well. And I think overall, I mean, when you think about methods of communication, um, we are in the environment and everybody on this, on this webinar has probably heard this, you know, the emails aren't getting you what you got in the past. They just are not working. You still need to send them. You still need to have, there's particular use cases for all of them. Phone calls the same way, 
but using other resources, uh, your website, your website's a huge resource everybody probably knows about, but also just pay attention to that. And then the texting, just like um, uh, was, was asked a moment ago. It's like, this. these are the places where your alum are. They just graduated. They, they do texting all the time. They do other kinds of, of communication, social media. Um, so finding ways to communicate with them via those channels are gonna be absolutely critical to keep them engaged. Just sharing in the comments an article on texting takeovers. Uh, some of our Mongoose content um, has texting takeover tips in it. I'm about to put it in the comments right now. I'm gonna just I just added one too, Greg. We're oh, probably on the it. same mind. <laughs> but yeah, definitely we have lots of resources when it comes to texting for alumni and advancement and all the different areas you can over on the Mongoose blog. So make sure you're checking it out. Um, Nicole also just added on top of her comment more on the community college space is that that's one of her institution's weaknesses is keeping in touch with the transfers and they're trying to work on it. Yeah, and that is not a surprise. Nicole, and thanks for sharing that. Um, I, that is a challenge, I think, across the board. And that's, again, what makes it a great opportunity, right, for, for so many different institutions. Part of it comes down to having a system in place at whatever institution, whether it's a community college or not, where you're effectively tracking where students are. And part of it is just staying in touch with them when they leave, right? I think when lots of folks either graduate and go on, they're probably more apt to be connected to. But what happens in the community college world when a student has been with you for a semester for a year, right? And, and then they go off to the four-year institution. You didn't lose them because of an, an issue of retention. You lost them because they went on to the next step of their process. So they're still considered, I think, they're still considered an alumnus because they successfully um, had that engagement at your institution. So it's trying to figure out how to stay in touch with those folks and working very closely with your registrar's office in most cases to be able to stay in contact with that information. Very good. So we alluded to discussing other challenges. It's in the so title. It is. Yeah. <laughs> so we have to address it. So um, I guess starting with Kelly, what are some other challenges you foresee now or in the extremely near future? Yeah, there's definitely a few of them, but one of them that I definitely want to start with is the great resignation, mm -hmm. right? I think institutions everywhere are experiencing as they're seeing staff leaving and having troubles even filling those positions again so that it's leaving your staff and faculty with a little more work to do. You're possibly doing two jobs, a job and a half. Um, there's other things that can contribute to that too, as I know um, some institutions are experiencing budget cuts. So there's even pieces of just having to do more with less right now, right? And this is definitely impacting your faculty and staff, which then impacts the service that they're able to give to the students and does cause like deeper ground issues all around in higher education, right? So starting there and trying to find ways to remedy that on the short term and the long term to try to refill those positions or restructure things so that you can take some load off of people or even in the short term specifically, finding ways to prevent burnout, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that is offering different benefits, more vacation days, um, more work from home time, different things to kind of alleviate some of that additional stress that can be taken on. Absolutely. Um, I'll go down another path that everybody probably has heard in one way, shape or form about is really the politics and how politics right now continues to be even more pervasive within higher education right now, uh, depending on your state in particular. Um, and, you know, just as a use case example, I'll pick on Florida. Um, but the reality ends up being that um, there is far more use of higher education in the political warfare than I think ever has been there. Um, and again, lots of it's on the on the state by state basis, but across the board, um, I think you're starting to see this. And we're looking at it from the standpoint of that the faculty level um, issues with tenure that we haven't dealt with yet at this point and what that's going to end up looking like. Um, but even from the standpoint um, of how that those politics or those political divides are going to impact resources, uh, financial resources at the state level. Um, what kind of resources? I mean, there's always there's been a shift over the last 10, 15 years, anyways, about how much funding has has been coming from different states uh, into their state institutions versus tuition. Um, I think that will continue to change over the period of time in a lot of these states as well, um, and maybe not for the good. 
uh, when it comes to what's going to have to come out of the family's pockets in that process. But it, it's sad, but it's a reality that, that higher education is being used. And I'm going to use the term loosely right now, but as a weapon um, in many, many cases, because um, people are being scared off of attending and they're using all the regular um, resources, right? They're using, oh, it costs too much. Oh, it's not worth it. When you leave instant, when, when you leave higher education, you're not going to make the money that, that back that you need to in order to pay your student loan and so on and so forth. We're seeing the, the, the issues with um, everything that the Biden administration has recently done with um, uh, re, um, paying off um, percentage of student loans for students and, and how that political divide has has continued on in the discussions and now the fact that it's in the in the courts hands in that process so i think the politics within higher education or related to higher education having higher education pulled into it um will be a huge huge factor coming up over the next 10 years yeah but you can't you can't argue with value mike and That's if true. Uh, an institution shows value it's still a fact that um uh, the more educated you are overall in this country depending on what industry you work in the more educated you are uh, the more that you will um, have as an income. Um, so demonstrating value is huge. Yes. So how, Jeff, how would you do that? How would you demonstrate value? So Jeff, there's, but no, Mike, we always ask the big questions, yes. right? Um, I, think value, I think value can be just demonstrated in a lot of ways. I'm going to go back to what I said a little earlier when it comes to the customer service experience and how that can be, um, can be demonstrated from day one when you engage with students as in the recruitment process, right? I think that process can be done. Um, but for sure, when you have students on campus and their families, you know, tied in with both students and the families together, um, what does that service look like there? And so demonstrating that value. And I honestly think you're going to see um, certain institutions rise to the top based on how that service um, or how intricate they can get with that service and how it, it really impacts across campus in that process. So service, I think, would be a big one. I think the other aspect to this, again, we talked earlier about this, um, when it comes to service, that's one aspect of retention. So how can you as an institution really do very deep planning and deep preparation um, and, and resourcing for retention so that you can keep the students you have and not have to worry as much about increasing on the front. Mm -hmm. I think something important to definitely touch on too when considering value, you absolutely have to consider cost because um, there has been an incline over the past 40 years, I believe, um, as far as cost of attendance, right, which can definitely affect the perception of the value of getting a degree and putting your time into that. Um, over the pandemic, those numbers have looked a little different. There has not been such a steep incline in the cost to go to a university, which has been helpful, um, but that is something to definitely take into account when trying to communicate the value that you get at an institution, there's also ways to better communicate what cost actually is at an institution as well, which some institutions do a better job of communicating than others. So Kelly, in that, in that vein, is there a way for institutions to address, um, you know, net tuition and tuition discounts? Yeah, so this is something that we were talking of, Jeff and I were definitely discussing. Um, many, specifically private institutions, often do some pretty hefty discounting, right? Um, I can't remember. We were staring at those stats earlier today. Yeah, Lexi, do you mind sharing? I think we have, might have a chart, actually. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Yes. So over the past 10 years, there's definitely been about a 10% incline in discounting. And that is pretty extreme to look at the first time undergraduates, you see 54.5% of a tuition discount. Um, but what's unfortunate to take into account, I actually saw a niche study that recently said that 80% of students don't even apply to an institution that has a large sticker price, right? So that's enough to scare students away. And a lot of students don't necessarily understand what discounting even is. Mm -hmm. um, so finding ways to communicate that effectively and not just in the sense of, we cost this much. On average, students get $32,000 per year, you know, but getting a little deeper into that and maybe explaining what the average price actually is, being more straightforward with that is helpful too. And I know, Jeff, you had some thoughts on this as well. Well, no, and I think, and I think you hit on them, Kelly, the, the reality of confusion when it comes to um, what this whole discount is. I cannot tell you, and, and again, anybody working in higher education that's on this webinar for sure, 
can tell you that you've had friends that aren't in the field and their kids are going off to college and you're trying to explain to them what a discount rate is. And <laughs> it's just not easy. I mean, there's a, you, you can't really effectively. And for us, it's not that hard to figure out, right? But for folks that are outside, this is all about a PR perception scenario when we talk about do people understand what these costs are going to be looking like. Factor into this the regulations that are also out there upon us about what has to be shared, right? What kinds of information? We always, of course, want to be transparent in our information, but the feds also require certain pieces of data being put out there. And without proper understanding of what some of that data is, there is a ton of confusion. And that whole process could be cleaned up and it could definitely be um, a lot easier. Now, when we talk about, um, when Kelly and I are sitting here talking about, um, you know, these changes that you can be making, some of these things are massive. If you think about it, they are just, they are really massive things that you have to really rethink what we know about higher education, right? And what we know about the perception of higher education. So this is also a challenge to all of us to rethink what we've known and, re and, and put it in that framework of what our, what our students, what our customers know and, and how to make it work easier for them. And taking this all, one little bite at a time. I know I've had the tendency when I sit on a webinar like this and you hear all this information shared with people, it's like, oh my gosh, where do I start? Right. You, you start small on some different areas that you can control, right? And so those are the things that we want you to take away from this conversation today, which is, okay, think about for yourself, what can you control based on the role you play? What can you control to be able to have this kind of, this movement? I'm glad you said that because it is, it's, there's a lot like we have this discussion oh there's a there's a cliff plumbing in 2025 what do you do and there's just so much right. involved in what you do so um great advice and, and it kind of does segue into my next question um because it is about um peer-to-peer -peer evaluation like these students um uh will see your institution as a brand um just like car shoppers we all know about cars we all know what you have to go through to get a car um you can differentiate yourself from other institutions. So um, Kelly, talk about that. What can institutions do to um, differentiate themselves from other institutions? Yeah, just to kind of reiterate, customer service is such a huge place to start, right? Making sure that the students that you have are getting what they were hoping to get while they are there and more so that they can tell everybody about it so that it does encourage retention so that um, that is really a piece of who you are and making sure that you're serving up what your strengths are to your students while they are there. So making sure to focus on that retention from that side of things. There are a few other ways to kind of consider things. You can always consider the populations you're reaching out to. Um, you can always consider your program offerings, right? And making sure that you are adjusting your program offerings to meet the needs of the students that you're trying to be most appealing to. Um, but really it does, it's just about focusing on the service that you're providing. I am all for alignment and what you're communicating out for what you give and making sure you're actually serving these things to the students as well, because that absolutely impacts their experience. I'll also contend that there are a lot of institutions out there that have a good handle on that. Mm -hmm. The issue ends up being, and again, this goes back to part of Kelly's point, is how are they communicating it? Right. And so the question and if we could raise our, you know, there's no way to really raise your hand in this. How many folks on this webinar would actually say, oh, our website's awesome. <laughs> I, I don't know that anybody would would say that. And yet think about it. The website is the core place that everybody is getting your information about your institution. Hands down. They're, that's where they're going. Oh, I've got two minutes uh, or five seconds on my phone so that I can look up such and such institution or a uh, parent or influencer. Hey, my kid wants to look at this place. Let me look this up. Let me see how much it costs. Let me see what, what kind of programs they offer. How quick can they do that? How easy is it for them to be able to find the information on your site to get the answers they need? Because if it takes longer than six seconds, they're gone, right? Especially again, if you've got more institutions you're looking at, that are quicker and easier to find, more simplified to go through. It's, it's really critical that you've got um, a good, clear website and tools on your site in order to be able to direct students and their families um, uh, and influencers through your site, because your site's gonna be huge. I mean, it's just, it's the way websites are nowadays, they handle everything. Um, and so how quickly and easily can people get to the information they need? 
that's the key piece that you need to be looking at. Yeah, and I would say too, if and when you have students on campus for events, double and triple down on your campus culture, your campus identity. Um, there are a number of institutions. The first one that comes to mind is Duquesne in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They required students and families attending Accepted Students Day to actually do service. So they packed, I believe it was 70,000 jambalaya meals um, for, I, I guess, the Pittsburgh community because community service is a big aspect of the student experience as a Duke at Duquesne and they forced their students to do it. So they got a very authentic experience and they knew, you know what, I, I don't want to do four years of this. We weed those students out, but the students who were enthusiastic about community service, by the way, there are more that were enthusiastic than not, um, they enrolled. Duquesne actually had, um, I think in the last two years, they've had record classes. I think certainly in two of the last three years, they've had- And take that one step classes. back to what Kelly had talked about, right? Which is management of people's time in the mm -hmm. great resignation. So if you've got to, uh, Mike, to your point, if you've got folks that go into that and realize, nah, this isn't the fit for me. I don't wanna do this level of community service. Now you've got folks that you understand you're not, your team should not be spending the kind of time on, right? Mm -hmm. don't, don't treat your recruitment process the exact same way for every single student. Not every single student is, is in the same place. Yeah, it's definitely partially about understanding the students you're trying to pull in, right? Understanding the students that respond to the brand that you have and giving your time and effort to that. All right, good. Well, we still obviously have time for questions. I know Lexi put the note in chat, so uh, please ask away. But um, if I might ask, I guess starting with Kelly. You're the host, you can ask whatever you want. Well, I'm a host, not the host. But uh, what are some institutions you've seen uh, address some of these challenges and how they do it? Yeah, I actually might pass this to Jeff just because Jeff and I were, no, Jeff and I were having some good conversations and I feel like you had some good examples to throw out there. Well, I don't know if they're good. I have some examples that I think I can play out with, but um, a couple that have come to mind and, and, and Georgia State in particular has been, has been around with, with some of the work they've been doing in retention for a number of years. This isn't something new for them, but they have, they're an example of having invested heavily in retention um, and seen some very, very good results um, as far as that process is concerned. Um, I, one of the ones, and I apologize because the, the name of the institution escapes me right now, but there's, uh, I believe the school was in Iowa and just recently um, an article had come out, uh, maybe an Inside Higher Ed, that uh, talked about how they completely rethought their recruitment process. Um, and instead of trying to go get as many possible students as you can, uh, they really focused on a more limited number, again, like we've talked about today, of students that are most likely to attend, right? And there's lots of ways you can get there. There's modeling you can do. There's lots of things out there that are available. But have your staff spend their time working with students that are really considering your institution, that are serious about it. Don't waste time, when, it, especially if you don't have it, don't waste the time on students um, that are just kind of nosing around a little bit and aren't likely to attend. Two questions popping in. We want to make okay. sure we get to them. Lexi, uh, I believe Corey had a question. Yes, Corey coming in with the questions today. We love it. Has anyone had good experiences with intentionally using students as social media influencers? Any programs for rewarding social media posts, something similar? Short answer, yes. Um, I know we've had guests on this show that talked about like use your students um, to create content because that's the audience you're speaking to. So that should be the um, the, the, the speaker. So and keep it authentic, not yes. overproduced as well. It should look like it came we from We don't the want student. the Steve Buscemi backwards hat <laughs> carrying a skateboard saying, how do you do fellow students? <laughs> we want authentic <laughs> student engagement. Yeah. yeah. I would love to add to that just a little bit, actually. Um, at my previous institution, that was something we really put a lot of attention to. And we had AIAs, we call them, they were student ambassadors that did tours and whatnot. And we actually got them to help us with TikToks because nobody wants to see an admission counselor do a TikTok, right? They would prefer to see their peers doing those types of things, as well as a few other ways to be involved in social media as well. So that was actually just part of their job. And students seemed, prospective students seemed to respond to it really well and the students that were working with us were obviously getting paid to help us in that way and they enjoyed doing it as well well and yeah. i'll tell you if you want some other good data with it i mean there's a number of pieces that are out there but one i know that i've used and, and worked with with a number of folks is uh the e expectations report and talks a lot about uh what it is that students want to be able to see uh ruffalo no lovitz puts this thing out uh but these e expectation reports 
Um, as we watch it change over the years that it's run, you start to see how more and more students are looking for the videos, they're looking for the social media, those aspects. And if you're not there, they're not seeing you kind of thing. And so whether you've got your students or you should have a combination of your students um, producing those things and get your hands out of it, let the students do it, trust your students, your current students, um, or whether you as an institution are trying to, to frame some of this. One of the ways that I, I highly recommend uh, financial aid offices and enrollment managers take a look at, um, how are you explaining to students and their families financial aid? Um, are you using it through the traditional letters, face-to-face -face conversations, or are you actually, have you created or could you create a, a YouTube video that takes folks through it very, very creatively? And there are videos that are already out there that, that maybe you could tap into. So again, using those kinds of visuals, whether it's different kinds of social media, I think are really, really effective when it comes to, to um, communicating that information. And when you think video, think low budget, don't get worried right. but you could do it with a phone you could do it in front of your computer and they love that yeah. they yeah. love they, that they, they actually they respond better to that yeah yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah actually I'm i just have... shared a link in the chat um to one of our past fyis where we had dr liz gross from campus sonar um who specialized in social listening too they they had a lot of value to add there of um even some stuff you can do on the social media side that you know, just lets you listen to the conversations that students are having with their peers on social media without even having to interject yourself in the conversation at all. Um, and a fun fact for all our FYI participants, my role before Mongoose, I was actually a social media manager for a college. And one of our most successful things was having Instagram takeovers where we gave students our Instagram password for the week and they just shared on their stories. And we got to learn a lot about like what a day in the life of a student in that major is like and the different content ideas we could share after that. So definitely fun utilize. fact about Lexi's fun fact is that she hates doing social media, but that was her job. <laughs> that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> that's true. Our, RNL, did the e RNL did the EX expectations report. I know people are asking that yes. question. Yep, yeah, exactly. The other thing to remember, and again, I, I used to get into these discussions when I was on campus about, you know, how do we trust these students? If you trust a student to, if you trust a student to hire them as a student ambassador for you, you definitely should be trusting them to take over your social media for a little yes. bit. And we've talked students. I want to throw one quick plug out there. Your faculty as well. So if you have the leading expert on, you know, Pacific Northwest architecture, um, that sort of stuff gets incredible. Um, traction on social media. Um, I think we have a link somewhere. Um, Texas A&M, uh, you're sorry, Texas A&M, their physics and astronomy department has an incredible TikTok page where their professors do uh, basically lab experiments um, over TikTok. And it's really fun and neat. And uh, again, you can leverage your uh, faculty, particularly the ones that are a little bit more outgoing. I'm freaking out. We've never had this many questions come I in. Know. I don't know what to do. It's so good. we've reached three o'clock. So if you have a meeting, um, go to yeah. your meeting. But uh, if our guests, do you have time for one more question, Jeff and Kelly? I believe we have Absolutely. one more minute. Lexi, let's get that last question. And I appreciate the question so much. She's putting links in. She's <laughs> responding to people. She's the social media queen. Um, Lexi, let's get that last question. <laughs> yeah, so I did drop the e-expectations link in there as well for you, buddy. So you can check that out. Our last question came from Carla again, I think. Alyssa. I'm scrolling up. There's been so much activity. Yes. Alyssa, Alyssa, there it is. Yes. So is anyone finding that this year's senior class is more unprepared or Ooh. delayed than those from pre-COVID? Use the chat um, yeah, audience no members uh, because you would be the experts on this, of course. So Yeah. So, so everything we're starting to hear from testing, because I think actually as recent as yesterday or the day before, we started to see some testing results coming back that the, that the test numbers have started to drop or have dropped uh, with the COVID with now seniors that, that had gone through the COVID process. Again, the, I don't think it's a surprise because of, of, of the just massive um, interruption to our lives that, that was COVID. Um, school, the whole concept of high school and elementary school, even in, and of course college, just shifted. And it shifted for a period of time, enough of time um, to impact um, people's retention of information and tracking of information. So I just, I'm not surprised by it. It's sad to see the numbers as they come in, but absolutely of no surprise. 
Jeff, I'd like to add, um, from my experience from last year, um, I definitely, we saw that just during COVID, right, that students were responding differently, even when they were getting back into kind of what was considered a new normal, right, going back into the classroom and whatnot. Um, I would have so many conversations with students, with parents, with high school counselors that would talk about how the students are just reacting differently. And part of that that is that they didn't necessarily get the same information around what the admission process and the college process really looks like. High school counselors tried like crazy to share that information, but it was much harder to get in contact with the students during that time because many people were at home. So there is just a little less background knowledge to start with and expectations kind of shifted for those students too, just from the conversations I had with the high school counselors that would talk about how students got used to getting more um, flexibility, getting more grace and things like that during COVID, where deadlines would get pushed and different things along those lines. And so kind of steering back in the direction of no deadlines really matter <laughs> is something that is going to take some time to steer the bus in the right direction. So I can't speak to this year specifically, but I watched it continue on um, as I was in higher education. So it's not surprising to me either. Wow. Um, what an hour. Uh, yes. Kelly and Jeff, you both were great. Um, Lexi is going to put in our chat um, how to get in touch with you folks. Um, if anyone wants to ask Jeff a question or Kelly a question, um, you can certainly email them, Kelly at Mongoose, Kelly I at mongooseresearch.com and Jeff at mongooseresearch.com. We have that in the chat, but if you're watching on the replay, get a hold of Jeff and Kelly on their LinkedIn's and their emails um, for more great advice because we didn't even get the takeaways. No. We ran out of time. This episode has been brought to you by Mongoose, makers of Cadence, higher ed's premier engagement platform. You, you, you folks stayed so long with yes, us, even thank a little, you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Um, thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed it. Mike, B minus today. Um, no, you B. in particular, oh, you okay, did great. Yeah, yeah, I'm you. a harsh grader. No, Mike, you, you are. did great. Wow, yes. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, Jeff, yes. uh, we'll give you a chance to say goodbye to the folks. Thank you so much for being here today, though. Yes, thank you so much. It was great chatting with you all. Please feel free. Reach out if you have any questions. I would love to connect. Absolutely. LinkedIn is probably the best way to catch us. Um, but again, this topic could go, as uh, as Greg just said, this topic could go on for days. So yes. love to chat. It can't go on for days. We have work uh, to do. Yeah. Um, we have another episode coming up we in do. two weeks. Mike, what are we talking we about? Do. So we'll talk I about... honestly don't know. So I'm asking. Yes. Okay. So we're talking about representation in technology with Dr. Kashona Gray from the University of Kentucky uh, that same time next uh, in two weeks. Uh, so that'll be November 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern. So. Thank you so much for joining us. Lexi, thank you for your producing yes. speciality. And uh, everyone uh, in our FY audience, thanks for being here today. Let's go, go Griffs. Go Griffs. Yeah. Ask me about Toledo. <laughs>